This is a lecture on chemical bonds. It is part of module two, which includes chemical bonds, atomic structure, and biological molecules. So for this section of the PowerPoint, I want you to be able to explain the four types of bonds formed between atoms. So there are four types of chemical bonds. We have nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, ionic, and hydrogen. Now notice that the first two bonds have the same word with them, covalent. So this is a general term that refers to the fact that atoms share electrons in this bond, okay? So the word co means beside or um, adjacent and valent is referring to electrons in the atom. So covalent bonds, I'm gonna write this down for you. Covalent means that two atoms share electrons. Now they do not share electrons in hydrogen or ionic bonds. So first we are going to look at how an atom is structured. Now, one thing that I would like you to remember about chemical bonds, it, it, it is the number of electrons that determines the type of bonds that are formed. So let me say that again. It is the number of electrons in an atom that determines the type of bonds that are formed. Now, this is a simplification, what I'm going to explain here, but it helps to visualize how chemical bonds work. So what you're seeing here is an atom of carbon on top here and an atom of oxygen on the bottom. Now, electrons occupy different areas of an atom. They're different distances from the nucleus. Now remember, the nucleus is protons plus neutrons, and it has a positive charge. Electrons orbit around the nucleus, and they have a negative charge. So when we are looking at electron shells, which is what we call these orbits around the nucleus. Each shell can hold a certain number of electrons. So let me write that here. Okay, each electron shell in an atom can hold a given, given number of electrons. Okay, so that is the first thing that you need to remember. So an atom will gain, means like take from another atom, lose, or share electrons show that the outer shell is full. I'll give you a second with that information. Okay, an atom will gain, lose, or share electrons so that the outer shell is full. So let's look at carbon. 
the first orbit that you see, I'll draw, oops, I'll draw a line on it so you know where I'm talking about. Okay, this is the first orbit or shell. It can hold two electrons, these are electrons, the little circles, two electrons total. Then it is full. Okay, here is an outer shell on carbon. So if you see down here on the slide where I wrote, shells two and three can hold eight electrons each. Now carbon only has two shells. We have the innermost shell, which is one, and then we're on shell number two. It can hold eight electrons total. Carbon has four. I'm gonna show you how you know this or can figure it out, okay? There, are carbon's electrons. So let's go to the whiteboard and we're going to draw a couple of these diagrams. So these are called Lewis dot structures. You do not need to remember that, but if you look it up online, that's what they're called. Okay. Now let's look at carbon. In the periodic table, the symbol for carbon is C. It has a 6 on top and a 12 on the bottom. Now you should know what the 6 means. Okay, it's called atomic number, and it is the number of protons in carbon. Below it, the 12 is atomic weight. This is the number of protons plus neutrons. So here I'm showing you that if an atom has six protons, it has to be carbon. But now we want to look at electrons. So how do you know by looking at this, how many electrons are in carbon? Well, unless it is an ion, which I'll explain later, the number of protons equals the number of electrons equals the number of neutrons. So in carbon, there are six protons, six electrons, six neutrons. Because protons equal electrons equal neutrons. So let's take a look at how you draw the dot structure for this. I'm going to put a C, which is basically supposed to be the nucleus. So here we have the first shell. Now remember, the first shell can hold two electrons. That is the most it can hold. Now carbon has six electrons. We have already used up two. And by used up, I mean we have drawn them in our diagram. So we have to draw another shell because carbon has four more electrons that we have to place. Now, I'm gonna put an electron here here, here, and here. Now carbon has all six of its electrons on the diagram. Now what you want to look at is 
how many more electrons does carbon need to fill its outer shell? So let me repeat that. You want to look at how many electrons carbon needs to fill its outer shell. Its outer shell can hold eight electrons. So carbon needs four electrons to have a full outer shell. Okay. Now remember that I told you that an atom will gain, lose, or share electrons so that it has an outer shell or a full outer shell. So let's look at another atom. Here we have hydrogen. It has one proton, therefore it has one electron. So here is what hydrogen looks like. We'll use an H for its nucleus, and we're gonna draw our first shell. Now remember, hydrogen has one electron, so I'm gonna put it right there. It needs two electrons to fill that shell. Okay, so hydrogen needs one more electron to fill its outer shell because the first shell can only hold two. So what is going to happen here is hydrogen is going to share its electron with carbon and carbon will share its electron. So when they share electrons, those electrons are considered part of both atoms. So now it's like this hydrogen has two electrons, but carbon has in its outer shell one, two, three, four, five. It needs three more. So we're gonna put a hydrogen right here. with its one electron and they will share. So this hydrogen is full on the top, the hydrogen on the side is full. And here we go. We have another hydrogen, they will share. And we're gonna put a hydrogen down here. And those will be shared. Now, carbon has its eight electrons in its outer shell. And the hydrogens each have two. So everybody's happy. Now this molecule I just drew is methane. We call it CH4. You do not have to know that. You also will not have to draw these dot structures. I just want you to see how a covalent bond works. So covalent means that they are sharing electrons. So let's briefly go back to the PowerPoint and then I'll go back to methane. So now remember there are two types of covalent bonds. One of which is non-polar covalent. So I wrote here that in covalent bonds, atoms share electrons. Now in nonpolar covalent bonds, we say that the electrons are shared equally between atoms. Now remember electrons are orbiting the nucleus. 
And what I mean by electrons are shared equally is that they spend equal time near each nucleus. So the atoms are going to orbit around this nucleus and they'll orbit around this nucleus, but they'll do it about the same amount of time. Okay, they'll orbit 50% of the time around this nucleus and 50% around this nucleus. That is what we call nonpolar. Okay, so let me show you here. Methane is nonpolar. So let's talk a minute about how you figure out if a covalent bond is polar or nonpolar. Okay, so you can think of an atom like a magnet. Okay, let's talk about the nucleus. That would be like the positive part of your magnet. The electrons are negative. So if you have a big nucleus, it's like a really strong magnet. And it's pulling those electrons towards itself, right? It has a big positive charge, pulling those negative charges towards itself. Now, some atoms, like carbon and hydrogen, are very weak. They are not strong magnets. So they do not pull the electrons towards themselves very much. I mean, the electrons are not going to fly out into space, but they're also not like pulled in towards those nuclei. So in a nonpolar covalent bond, the nuclei of both atoms are similar This is how we say it. The nuclei of both atoms, like hydrogen and carbon, are similar regarding their affinity for electrons. Affinity is basically the same as saying how strong they are in pulling in those electrons, right? Affinity means like um, how attractive are they regarding like electrons, right? So in a nonpolar bond, uh, I can't see. Um, carbon bonded to hydrogen is always nonpolar covalent. That is what I want you to remember. Carbon bonded to hydrogen is always nonpolar covalent because the nuclei are the same strength. Those electrons will orbit equally around hydrogen and the carbon. Okay. So now we are going to look at polar covalent. Water is the best example of a polar covalent molecule. That means it's made of polar covalent bonds. So water is the best example of a polar covalent molecule, which means it is made of polar covalent bonds. So the official definition of a polar covalent bond is that electrons are shared unequally between atoms. Okay. And this gives the molecule areas of different charge, positive or negative. So here we have water. Oxygen has a negative charge. Hydrogen has positive charge. 
let's see how this works. Okay, so we are looking at polar covalent bond. Okay, let's do water. So water is H2O, which you should know that that's water. Now, oxygen has eight, that's an eight. Let me make that easier to read. Oxygen has eight protons. Therefore, you should know that it has eight electrons. Hydrogen, like we just saw, has one proton. Therefore, it has one electron. So here we're putting O for the oxygen nucleus. Let's draw our first shell. Has two electrons total. Now remember, oxygen has eight electrons. We've used two. So you have to draw another shell. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we're gonna put our eighth one right here on the bottom. Now, oxygen has six electrons in that outer shell, but remember it needs eight. So here's how water is formed. We put an H right here, with the one shell and the one electron and they are going to share. Put an H over here, and our one electron, and they are going to share. Now, oxygen is a super strong magnet. Really pulls those electrons towards itself. Hydrogen is weak, okay? So what is going to happen, now notice here, oxygen has eight electrons in its outer shell. It is going to pull all those electrons towards its nucleus. So those electrons will mostly orbit oxygen. Every once in a while they'll go around hydrogen, but not very often because hydrogen's super weak. So oxygen is pulling those electrons away. So what that means is that oxygen has a negative charge. Remember, negative is, electrons are negative. So we say that oxygen has a negative charge. That weird little symbol I drew means partial. And I'll contrast that with ions in just a minute. Now, because it's almost like hydrogen lost its electron, it has a positive charge. Okay, if an atom loses electrons, it gets a positive charge because you're taking those negative charges away. Okay, so this is a polar molecule. It is formed by polar covalent bonds. Okay, water is a polar molecule formed by polar covalent bonds between the oxygen and the hydrogens. A polar molecule has regions that are positive and regions that are negative. 
okay? So when we say polar molecule, I'm looking at the entire molecule, right? So the area by oxygen is negative, the areas by hydrogens are positive. Now, here's what I really want you to remember. If a molecule has an oxygen or nitrogen bonded to carbon or hydrogen, it is a polar molecule. Okay, if it's an oxygen or a nitrogen, those are both super strong atoms, and they are bonded to carbon or hydrogen, it is a polar molecule formed by polar covalent bonds. Just like water has oxygen bonded to hydrogen. So remember that nonpolar is usually carbon to hydrogen. Those are the um, atoms I will use as examples, carbon to hydrogen, nonpolar. Oxygen or nitrogen bonded to carbon or hydrogen is always polar. You have strong atom bonded to a weak one. Okay, so that's why it shows these positive and negative charges by the oxygen and the hydrogens. So let's move on. We've talked about covalent bonds. That means they share electrons. Now we are going to look at what an ion is and how they form an ionic bond. So an ion is an atom that gains or loses electrons and has a charge. So let me write that down for you. When I say has a charge, I mean positive or negative. So an ion is an atom that has gained or lost electrons and has a charge. So let's take a look at this. Let's talk about sodium. Sodium is Na. Normally it has 11 protons and 11 electrons. So we put 11 plus charges because it has 11 protons and those are positive. 11 negative charges because it has 11 electrons and those are negative. Now you have the same number of positives as you do negatives. So what that means is they cancel each other out. Okay. So there is no charge. Now, another atom, chlorine, usually steals an electron from sodium, just strips it off, takes it away. So when that happens, you have 11 positive and 10 negative. So you have an extra positive charge. So it's a plus. And we now write sodium ion, N-A, and we put the plus as a superscript. Now it could have, like calcium gets two electrons stolen usually. So calcium would be Ca2 plus. Okay, now let's look at chlorine. 
Chlorine normally has 17 protons, so it has 17 electrons. Okay, the positive and negative charges cancel each other out. So there is no charge. But now chlorine often steals an electron from sodium. So now you have 17 plus and 18 minus, 18 electrons. So you can see here that you have an extra negative charge. So we write chlorine, now it's called a chloride ion, Cl minus. Okay, so now you can see that these are ions. They have charges. Sodium ion, Na plus, chloride ion, ion, Cl minus. So let's look at an ionic bond. Okay, NaCl is table salt. Very common. So let's write that here. Whoops. So we have Na. Now, once they're in an ionic bond, I don't write the charges anymore. I just write NaCl. Now, if I ask you a question about an ionic bond in a quiz, I will probably use NaCl, right? I'll wait for you guys to take chemistry until you have to figure out which atoms bond which way. That's not important for this class. All I want you to know is how the bonds form. So when you have ions, a positive ion will be attracted to a negative ion. They are not sharing electrons, you just have opposite charges attracted. So a negative ion will always be attracted to a positive ion. Now, NaCl table salt is like a crystal kind of structure, right? It has a, a repeating formation. So it's many NaCls that are all kind of um, solidified together. Okay, so remember, we have nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, and ionic. The last bond you need to learn is a hydrogen bond. Okay, now a hydrogen bond occurs between a hydrogen that is in a polar molecule with another atom that is also in a polar molecule. I put usually oxygen or nitrogen. So let's go to the whiteboard and we'll look at how this works so you can visualize it. Okay, so we're on hydrogen bond. Okay. So let's look at a hydrogen bond between water molecules. All right, so here I have my oxygen. And I'm gonna just draw lines to show you covalent bonds. I'm not gonna draw the dot structures, okay? Now remember, oxygen has this weird little symbol and a minus. Now the reason that we have that symbol that means partial negative is this is not an ion. It's a polar covalent bond that causes these different charges because the electrons are shared unequally. So we put that little symbol to show you the difference between an ion and a polar molecule. So now I'm going to draw, I'm gonna this little part here, 
Here's another water molecule. Okay, we've got our positive charges and our negative charge. Now remember, a covalent bond we show with a solid line. A hydrogen bond, we use a dotted line. So now your positive hydrogen in one, water, one water molecule is attracted to your negative oxygen in a different water molecule. That is what a hydrogen bond is. Now remember I said these atoms have to be in polar molecules because it is the polar molecule that gives it its different charges, right? It's that positive charge of the hydrogen and it's attracted to that negative oxygen. Opposite charges attract, okay? But you have to have two molecules. Here's a molecule. Here's a molecule. The hydrogen in one molecule is attracted to the oxygen in another. So remember that I told you for a nonpolar covalent bond, it is usually between carbon and hydrogen. A polar covalent is usually between oxygen or nitrogen bonded with carbon or hydrogen. So a hydrogen bond occurs, I'll put usually occurs because it doesn't have to be oxygen and nitrogen, but hydrogen bond usually occurs between a hydrogen and an oxygen or nitrogen. Because remember, it, in a polar molecule, you usually have oxygen or nitrogen bonded to carbon or hydrogen, okay? Which gives it the areas of different charge. So the hydrogen bond, it'll always have a hydrogen with a partial positive charge. It's usually attracted to an oxygen or nitrogen in another molecule. And this is how water is formed. Many H2O molecules bonded together. Okay. So that is the end of the chemical bonding section of module two. I will also post these whiteboards on the page where I embed the video.